uh, I need to remind you guys to enter our giveaway for Monster Hunter Rise or two $20 Nintendo Switch or PlayStation or Xbox gift cards. Head down to the description for that. Hey everyone, welcome back to another news collaboration. I am here to bring you the news of video game stuff. <clears throat> lots of big stories, lots of stuff to get through. I got all these notes. Uh, and of course, we're starting out with the NPD report. That's right, more sales data. Yesterday, we talked about the sales update in Japan. Today, we have the full sales data for the month of February in the United States. Uh, first off, consumer spending has reached a record 4.5% billion dollars for the month of February, which is a 35% increase over last year. Hardware sales themselves went up 121% to 406 million year over year. The most spent on hardware period in the United States for February since the 468 million spent in February of 2011. I think you guys can go back then and realize why that happened. Uh, the switch topped the charts in both unit and dollar sales for the month, that's right, Switch is a number one. It was the highest dollar and unit sales of any platform in February since the Nintendo Wii in 2009. The Switch, and it's, you know, technically part of its fifth year. The Switch has started its fifth year. Technically, this was part of the fourth year, but it's killing it. It's killing it. It's doing 2009 Wii numbers. Lifetime dollar sales for the Switch has now passed the Nintendo DS, making Switch Nintendo's second best-selling platform in U.S. tracked history, just behind Wii. Overall, Switch is the seventh best-selling hardware platform in U.S. history. Yes, folks, Sony and Xbox have been that big in the U.S. that despite the Switch's mega sales, it's only at number seven. But you know what? There's still, what, according to Furukawa, another three, another four, another five years to go. It's going to keep climbing and climbing and climbing. All right, setting the side switch, the PlayStation 5 was the second best-selling hardware for the month in both unit and dollar sales. Also, PlayStation 5 is the fastest-selling hardware platform in U.S. history in terms of dollar sales after four months. Um, so not the best fastest-selling unit sales. Uh, which I think that record is still held by Switch, but it is the fastest in dollar sales, which the Switch previously also held that record. But again, PlayStation 5 has a digital version at 400 and the big fat version at 5, so it's a more expensive platform. The only other system Sony's launched at that $500 price point or higher was back with PlayStation 3, and we all know that that did not do so hot out the gate. So, hey, this is really good news for Sony. PlayStation 5 is flying off store shelves and continues to fly off store shelves, and they're making at least... Money-wise, a lot of money. Don't know if they're actually using money per unit sold. Uh, Sony tends to do that sometimes. But let's get into more sales data here. 3D World and plus Bowser's Fury was the best-selling game in February, even without digital sales. Remember, digital sales are not tracked by the MPD. Uh, that is insane. Uh, it's also the second best-selling game year to date. Uh, what's interesting is when this game debuted seven years ago, it didn't even crack the top 10, and here it is at number one. Wow, what a difference a new generation of systems can make. Uh, Indie Darling Little Nightmares 2 was the fifth best-selling game on Xbox and the 10th best-selling on PlayStation. Also, I think the original Little Nightmares ended up like selling, or Little Nightmares 2, I guess they announced they sold over a million units or something like that. Woo! Like, that's awesome news. You usually don't see indie games cracking the sales charts very often. So this is great uh, for Little Nightmares 2. There's so much data here. So first, let's look at Xbox 2021. Uh, it's top selling 10 games in February. We're Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War at number one. Madden NFL, uh, some news on Madden coming up here too. Uh, at number two, Assassin's Creed Valhalla at number three, Call of Duty, two Call of Duty games in the top five, Call of Duty Modern Warfare at number four, Little Nightmares at number five, as we mentioned before, uh, Forza Horizon 4 at number six, FIFA 21 at uh, number seven, Minecraft Xbox One Edition at number eight, and Mortal Kombat 11 at number nine, capped off by UFC 4 at number 10. Moving on, here's the top 10 selling games for February on PlayStation. Uh, this includes Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War at number one, Marvel's Spider-Man Miles Morales at number two. Really impressive to see that game still up there considering that it launched all the way back in November. 
Uh, Persona 5 Strikers, which is a new release at number 3. Madden at number 4. Assassin's Creed Valhalla at 5. Minecraft PlayStation 4 Edition at 6. NBA 2K21 at 7. FIFA 21 at 8. Modern Call of Duty Warfare at 9. And then Little Nightmares 2, as we mentioned before, at number 10. Next up, we have Nintendo Switch. Uh, the the number one game selling was obviously Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. Number two is Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Number three is Animal Crossing New Horizons. Number four is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Number five is Super Mario 3D All-Stars. Number six is Ring Fit Adventure. Number seven is Breath of the Wild. Number eight is Just Dance 2021. Number nine is Super Mario Party. And at number ten, we have new Super Mario Bros. Deluxe. Again, only digital sales are included for Just Dance 2021. And then Ring Fit Adventure obviously does not have digital sales since it has a required physical accessory. Year to date, these are the top 10 selling games. So from January and February combined overall in the whole game industry in the United States. Uh, at number one is Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War. As we mentioned before, Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Furies at number two, Marvel's Spider-Man Miles Morales at number three, Assassin's Creed Valhalla at four, Madden at five, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe at six, Animal Crossing New Horizons at seven, Call of Duty Modern Warfare at eight, Persona 5 Strikers at nine, and Ring Fit Adventure is in the top ten for this year at number ten. Now here's our top 20 for all platforms when it comes to February at number one, as we mentioned before, was Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. Then at number two, we have Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War. At number three is Persona 5 Strikers. At number four is Marvel's Spider-Man Miles Morales. At number five is Madden. At number six is Little Nightmares 2, so number six overall. At number seven is Assassin's Creed Valhalla. At number eight is Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. At number nine is Animal Crossing New Horizons. At number 10 is Call of Duty Modern Warfare. At 11, we have FIFA 21. At 12, we have NBA 2K21. At 13, we have Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. At uh, 14, we have Mortal Kombat 11. At 15, we have Super Mario 3D All-Stars. 16, Ring Fit Adventure. 17, Just Dance 2021. 18 is Minecraft PlayStation 4 Edition. 19 is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. And 20 is Immortal Phoenix Rising. So that kind of wraps up all the sales data. Clearly, Switch Killing it. PlayStation, killing it. Uh, again, no sales data for Xbox because Xbox is refusing to report sales data when it comes to the systems. But we also know Xbox Series X is sold out as well. And I think if it would top at least in terms of dollar sales, we would hear about it. So clearly Xbox is at number three. Don't really know what this means for them. Uh, but for PlayStation over there and for Switch back here, uh, really, really, really good news. So let's say Madden might be coming to uh, Nintendo Switch in the future, um, if not this year, maybe the year after, uh, because Doctray81 is added again and found another hiring post by EA. This hiring post is for <coughs> an online software engineer who knows C++ for work on Madden with job requirements that need two years experience working for Microsoft, Sony, or Nintendo game consoles. Now, again... What does this even matter? Well, it matters because they do not mention Nintendo game consoles in any prior listing for a similar job for Madden. So, this does suggest that while this person doesn't have to have experience with Nintendo systems, that they are working on Madden on Nintendo systems. Now, you might be like, how the hell are they going to do that? Well, obviously, we know about the rumors of Switch Pro. We're not going to dive into that. It could be a Switch Pro exclusive. But uh, what's interesting here is that the Frostbite engine that needs to run on Switch to get Madden, well, guess what? It now runs on Switch with the upcoming release of Plants vs. Zombies. The team behind that made Frostbite run on Switch, which could open the door to more games. We've also had seen EA hiring to make Frostbite work on Switch uh, in prior years. Now we know that it is running on Switch. That could lead to Madden. Also for you FIFA players out there, that obviously opens the door to actually get a non-legacy edition of FIFA. Wouldn't that be sweet? Like an actual current version? I don't know. Maybe that's wishful thinking. Maybe the Madden thing's wishful thinking. But this is a hiring post for Madden that mentions Nintendo. So, hey, the door has now been cracked open. So yesterday I mentioned one of the biggest stories, if not the biggest story, was a roundtable discussion going on between Bethesda, id Software, essentially all the ZeniMax studios, and Phil Spencer. They did this really long pre-recorded conversation. And, well, the biggest thing people want to know about, especially if you are not an Xbox gamer, if you are a Nintendo Switch gamer, if you are a PlayStation gamer, is what the hell is going to happen with all of these games and will they be exclusive? Well, Phil Spencer clarified this quite clearly, and I want to read the full quote because just grabbing the little snippet that's put in headlines uh, doesn't do it justice. This adds all the clarification you need. So, 
Phil Spencer stated, I listened to the podcast and all the questions. So I'm going to try to be as clear as I can because that's what I, I, I just think it's fair. So obviously I can't sit here and say every Bethesda game is exclusive because we know that's not true. There's contractual obligations that we're going to see through as we always do in every one of these instances. Hence Hellblade coming to Switch. When they bought them, Hellblade was already in the works for Switch, so they they finished it up. We have games that exist on other platforms, and we're going to go support those games on those platforms that they're on. They're communities of players. We love those communities, and we'll continue to invest in them, and even in the future. There might be things that have either contractual things or legacy on different platforms that will go do. But if you're an Xbox customer, the thing I want you to know is this is about delivering great exclusive games for you that ship on platforms where Game Pass exists. And that's our goal. That's why we're doing this. That's the root of this partnership that we're building and the creative capability we will be able to bring to market for our Xbox customers. is going to be the best it's ever been for Xbox after we're done here. Now, obviously... What Phil Spencer is saying, what we always knew all along, is that, hey, they're going to fulfill the Deathloop contract. If there's any other games that are currently on platforms, like Elder Scrolls Online is on PlayStation 5, they're going to continue to support it. Any future DLC will also come to that, all that jazz. But when it comes to any new games moving forward that don't have current contractual agreements to appear on something like a PlayStation, guess what? It's only going to be on PC and Xbox Game Pass, and probably eventually uh, xCloud when that launches because I'm sure that's going to support Game Pass as well. This is really, really interesting uh, for PlayStation owners because they're pretty disappointed. We've seen the backlash coming forward again, which happened last year when this deal was initially uh, announced to be coming. Uh, PlayStation fans were really upset, but Phil Spencer is very, very clear about this. Future games are exclusive. That's just the way it's going to be. Me, personally, as someone who owns a Series X, a PlayStation 5, and a Switch, it doesn't really bother me. In fact, now I get all these Bethesda games for super cheap. In fact, today they released something like 20 major Bethesda games, um, all of them, all the way through their most recent releases on Game Pass. It's very clear what Microsoft is doing here. They they spent $7.5 billion on ZeniMax to make Game Pass one of the best services out there. This is akin to Netflix buying a major studio, all that jazz. So, hey, you know what? Kudos to Microsoft. If you're a Sony gamer, I know that this isn't great news for you. Uh, some people trying to argue still that Starfield, as an example, or Elder Scrolls 6, has to come to PlayStation 5. Uh, it, it doesn't because there's no contractual agreement. And Starfield, the one that we know the most about, has never officially had any platforms publicized or advertised or announced, suggesting that Starfield never actually had a commitment to come out on PlayStation. So Starfield, Elder Scrolls 6, two of the most anticipated Bethesda games. Yeah, you're going to have to own an Xbox or a gaming-capable PC. So there you go. Uh, for me, it doesn't matter, but kudos to Microsoft. Business is business. Uh, I don't think this is either good or bad news. I think the only good that you could argue comes from this overall is that obviously certain studios that were in flux are now going to have a, a massive cash inflow from Microsoft, so we don't have to worry about any studio closures anytime soon. Oh, and by the way, now that uh, games are, are, are kind of made just for PC and just for Xbox, typically that leads to games getting the most out of them. If you think about Nintendo exclusives, if you think about PlayStation exclusives, the reason they tend to be just like above third-party multi-platform games is, well, because everything is tailored specifically for the hardware, including at the engine level. Now they'll be able to do this at, at studios like Bethesda where they could take their engine, tailor it specifically and directly for Xbox Series S and X and for obviously PC. And that's going to lead to better visuals, better performance, and just prettier looking games. Uh, so that is a benefit technically to gamers overall in any situation like this when something becomes platform exclusive. But still obviously uh, a, a pretty big shifting thing in the industry it's hard to argue now at this point that microsoft does not at least start to compete exclusive wise with the playstations and nintendos so it's a move that microsoft needed to make someday and i'm actually kind of surprised phil spencer got the okay for it so kudos to phil spencer for convincing microsoft that gaming is actually worth investing in at a major level Speaking of Microsoft, 343 Industries did a massive 44-minute long Q&A today on YouTube. And my gosh, do we know a bunch about Halo Infinite. I'm going to go right to my notes because it's almost a full page of notes from this. 
Uh, so the Halo Infinite Zeta Halo ring is actually fully 3D rendered and creates brief eclipses with the sun when it passes behind the ring. Uh, they were asked what stops players from grabbing a banshee and just going to an objective further in the story, and the devs simply said, do it. So there's a lot of freedom, possibly even partially open world. The day slash night cycle will affect patrols. There'll be more sleeping grunts at night, but there'll also be phantoms with searchlights at night. There it will be dynamic weather, which includes wind and fog. Snowstorms and storms in general will be there, although it's going to be in a post-launch patch. There is no dual wielding in this game, no hostile wildlife, and no playable elites. Also, no weapon upgrades. Obviously, this stuff might be disappointing. Uh, equipment, aka non-weapons, can be upgraded, at least in the campaign mode. The hexagon pillars that people were upset about uh, in the last time they showed off the game should look a lot more pleasing at this point. Cutscenes are actually affected by the day slash night cycle and what weapons and equipments that you have equipped. Uh, this is because they are drawing a seamless... Uh, transition from gameplay into cutscene, uh, which is really, really good to see. Oftentimes, it's a bit jarring in games on the cutscene. Shows different clothing and different equipment than what you actually have on in the game. That's not going to be the case here, so that, that, that's good news. Uh, 343 is actually really glad for the community feedback and all the criticism received and thrilled that Microsoft gave them more time to work on the game. Uh, there are random encounters, but they are intended to be engaging rather than punishing. So, don't, so not like Dark Souls. Think more like Breath of the Wild, less Dark Souls. Uh, they admitted that Halo Infinite was actually a challenge to develop both internally and externally, but they are thrilled and like relieved that they were actually given the time to do things right. So it kind of sounds like Microsoft maybe had them on a crunch and was really trying to get them, like, we have to have this for launch, which you see that on the Xbox Series X with Halo literally on the back of it. Clearly Microsoft was pushing hard for this thing to be a launch game, but 343 is just like relieved that they were actually, that Microsoft backed off and said, no, let's get this right. So take the time that you need to get it done. Uh, the game was built heavily around player choice uh, and the world's reaction to those choices. So this, to me, feels a lot more like Mass Effect in a way. Uh, also, they were asked directly about the game being an open world. And uh, they basically talked around the question and just compared it to the silent cartographer and explaining how the world works. Also, by the way, the ring itself is not just eye candy. Uh, you can knock things off of it and it will float off into space. Again, we haven't been on this ring and seen these interactions, but it, it's going to be pretty cool, I assume. So, yeah, that's the, that's the news on Halo Infinite. It's just nice to get this news, nice to see the game a little bit. Now, we got to wait for gameplay reveals, release dates, all that jazz. I assume that this is probably lining up to be a big holiday game for Microsoft this year. Uh, we have one more update. The, the, the Crisis official Twitter account announced today that Crisis Remastered now officially supports DLSS 2.0 as of today. This is a big deal for PC gamers that wanted to revisit this game and revisit it with the best possible visuals because Crisis Remastered did what Crisis always does and crippled PC gaming hardware. Even 3090s, which are supposed to be able to game at 8K, if you try to game at 8K in this, my gosh, is the 3090 completely crippled? Well, guess what? DLSS 2.0 has arrived to save the day, providing nice upscaling so you can lower the resolution but still get a close to 4K experience. And yes, massive frame rate boost. This is huge. This is the kind of stuff we're talking about could happen with Switch and Switch Pro. This is obviously something that PC gamers are experiencing. Yes, DLSS 2.0 has to be patched into engines and games, but you know what? When it is, my lord, 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 and lord, is it amazing. So now Crisis Remastered is finally playable for everyone that at least owns a modern NVIDIA GPU. This last one is technically a leak. We can actually call this one a leak. I just did a little video yesterday about rumors and leaks, and most leaks are basically rumors. This is actually a leak because it comes from an official source. So Bandai Namco Latin America Instagram. That's right. Bandai Namco Latin America's Instagram. I didn't think I'd be talking about that today. Uh, their account accidentally uploaded a DLC trailer for Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, which released exclusively on PlayStation 4 last year. So there's a DLC pack coming out. They did a trailer for it on Instagram. Who really cares? Well, in that trailer, they talk about the Xbox Series X slash S and Nintendo Switch. The game is not on Xbox Series X or S or Switch. In fact, the game hasn't even been announced for those platforms. It's kind of a big oopsie, and it was spotted by uh, GameBolt.com and a user on Twitter, and their screenshots, it's, it, it's legit, it happened. 
Um, so there you go. They have deleted the trailer. No official announcement has occurred. Obviously, we assume official announcement is incoming. We don't know when the game is actually going to come, but it is a major AAA game. It's actually a game that reviewed really, really well for PlayStation, and it's just good that Xbox gamers and Switch gamers are going to get to experience it now as well. Obviously, we'll get tech analysis and all that from Digital Foundry and other places down the line comparing the Switch version. Like Technically, they just did a, a, a comparison of uh, Crash Bandicoot 4, PlayStation 5 versus Switch comparison of Crash Bandicoot 4, and basically it's a little bit blurry around switch and it runs at half the frame rate that's the news there not really worth reporting on but um i'm just pointing out that like yeah this is going to be probably a similar story probably still perfectly playable on switch obviously going to work really really well on the series x and s so woo, that's it thank you guys so much for tuning in to this giant news summary there was a lot of information in here i'm going to give you time to digest i'm going to include timestamps, which i'm sure you've already seen at this point all right folks i'm nathaniel rovo jance from nintendo prime and this was my news summary video. I got to come up with a name for this series. Kind of getting away from Prime News. I want to. I, I want to make this uh, something a little different. So thank you guys for tuning in, and I'll catch you in the next video.